Hi, my name is Sarah Hare, and I am doing a report on the rhesus negative factor um, for the Indie Birth Midwifery School Intro to Autonomous Midwifery course. Um, so I chose this one because it's a little harder for me than the other ones to talk about. I feel like I don't understand it as much. Um, so I kind of wanted to challenge myself a little bit. Um, so I will go ahead and start. Um, so Rh negative factor is something that has to do with blood typing. So we have our four main blood types, A, B, A, B, and O. And within those, there are different um, markers present on blood. So we have like 30 something different markers. Um, the rhesus factor is just one particular marker that can or cannot be present on the blood cells. So when a mother is Rh negative and she has an Rh positive partner, there is a chance that the baby is going to be Rh positive. So the baby will have these um, markers on their blood. The mother does not have that marker. So if their blood mixes at any point, um, the mother can have an immune reaction to the baby's blood and attack the baby's red blood cells. So obviously this can be really problematic sometimes. Um, other times it is a really minimal problem. Um, other times this doesn't even happen and there are no issues at all with the birth. Um, the baby is totally fine. Um, so in the 60s, they came up with this solution called Rogam or Anti-D, which is an injection um, into the muscle that basically gives those antibodies the mother's body would produce to attack the baby ahead of time. So it's like a prophylactic treatment. Um, it's usually um, given in the third trimester in the US and it's also given within 72 hours after birth. Um, so it does have some questionable ingredients um, and there's a big question about the necessity of it if there's like an undisturbed birth, if there aren't any events that would cause a fetal maternal hemorrhage, which is the appropriate term for when the blood from the baby and mother mix. Um, it's a little deceiving because it actually is not, it doesn't take like a full hemorrhage for that to occur. It's like 0.1 milliliters of blood um, can be all that it takes for a sensitization event to occur. Um, so this doesn't really matter with your first baby if you are Rh negative and your first baby is Rh positive. Um, it's not really a concern unless there's some kind of trauma to the abdomen, like a car accident or something like that. Um, so it's really a problem with subsequent pregnancies. And in fact, they found that it's usually the third or fourth pregnancy where issues with the baby can start to come up. So some issues are, like I said, really serious. Um, there is something called the hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, it can be really mild to moderate, like non-physiological jaundice, which is just treatment with, you know, lights and things like that. Um, anemia is definitely an issue with some babies. So prolonged cord clamping would obviously help a lot with that, um, really prolonged or not at all. Um, some babies can have enlargement of the liver and spleen um, and other organ damage from having anemia. And then there's a very serious um, disease called high drops fetalis, which is severe tissue edema, heart failure, stillbirth. Um, and then after the baby's born, they can have kernicteris, which is brain damage, deafness, seizures, and even death, which is obviously horrible, but super rare. Um, so about 50% of babies who actually um, have this disease have really mild hemolytic disease. So they just need like phototherapy and they might have some anemia after birth. It usually resolves on its own. Maybe they just need more blood testing. Um, about 25% of babies who have um, been attacked by their mom's body um, have moderate 
disease, so like the non-physiological jaundice, they might need transfusions. Um, and then another 25% have very severe hemolytic disease, including high drops or stillbirth. Um, however, the actual percent of people who would need to receive the ROGAM or anti-D um, is actually 2,500 to 3,000 women would need to receive ROGAM to prevent one baby death. So obviously there would still be other like um, hemolytic disease going on, but in terms of death, it would take about 2,500 to 3,000 women receiving prenatal ROGAM to prevent one death. So that could be a lot or that can be a little to you depending on your um, thinking. But the overall average risk of sensitization, which is the blood mixing events, um, is about 7.5%. Um, so that means the, uh, about 7.5% of women with the Rh negative factor and an Rh positive baby will be sensitized. Um, the interesting thing is that not all women who have um, a fetal maternal hemorrhage will actually be sensitized. So there isn't like a, a total understanding still of this whole process. There's a lot of research that could still be done um, to help understand more. Um, so Rogam um, is pretty questionable for a lot of reasons. Um, there's a lot of um, it, like lacking research. It was done um, in the 60s and it was done on prison populations, which isn't always like the best way to study things. Um, it does have mercury and thimerosal in it. Um, they do offer mercury-free options if you ask. Um, Rogram has been known to carry bloodborne infections because it's a collection of blood from many people. It's not just one person. So HIV and hepatitis C have been transmitted through it. Um, it does cross the placenta, so about 10% of the Rogam makes it through the placenta. And Rogam itself can actually cause anemia in the baby. Um, some babies have an anaphylactic reaction to the Rogam in utero. So it's not without its own problems. Um, and the studies that were done were really small, and like I said, the research that was done was questionable. Um, yeah. So when Rogam is given, it just really depends on where you are in the world and what you've experienced, how many pregnancies you've had, if you've had miscarriages and things like that. Um, so any sensitizing event would be when they would usually recommend giving it. So if you were in a car accident or something like that, um, if you've had a traumatic birth, um, and then some countries like the U.S. give it routinely at 28 weeks and then 34 to 36 weeks as well, um, pregnant. And yeah, um... I think I covered all that I feel comfortable covering, um, other than just to add, you know, babies that were gestated by a sensitized mom, so like a mother who's already had a pregnancy with a rhesus positive baby, and then she goes on to get pregnant again with another rhesus positive baby. Um, they have over a 90% chance of surviving with normal function without having any rogam. Um, so that's a pretty high percentage, um, but depending on your, you know, obviously your own opinions and feelings on the matter, that could be, um, also a scary percentage, like, so about 10% might not, um, survive with normal function. Um, there also are some thoughts that bioflavonoids uh, might reduce the risk of fetal maternal hemorrhage. So it's been theorized that 
1,000 milligrams of vitamin C three times a day and 400 milligrams of citrus vitamin P with rutin and hesperidin three times a day can help just prevent the fetal maternal hemorrhages. Um, I don't know how much research has been done to really show that. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I've got. Thanks for watching.